Good evening. I'm Oshin, and I welcome all who are present here for this webinar organized by Tethys Fossil Museum on ups and downs in the Himalayas, exploring the evolution of the world's greatest mountain chain through fossils by paleobiologist Nigel Hughes. Nigel Hughes is a renowned paleontologist and stratigrapher specializing in early Paleozoic animal life and environment. He has worked extensively in the area of paleoevolutionary development, developmental biology, on trilobite ontog ontogeny and on the early Paleozoic history of South and Southeast Asia. In his early days of exploration, Hughes walked through the Himalayan region from Nepal to Tibet, looking for trilobites that could help him reconstruct when and how these mountains formed. He completed his doctorate at the University of Bristol in England and was also involved in a refugee project dealing with displaced people in West Bengal, India, where he lived for a year. He serves as a professor of geology at the University of California, Riverside, and was the 2021 winner of the R.C. Moore Medal for Excellence in Paleontology. Present here with us is also Dr. Ritesh Arya, co-founder of Indian Geoparks and founder of Tethys Fossil Museum. He is a geologist known for finding water sources at multiple locations, locations in the high altitudes. He was instrumental in providing water to 3,800 Tibetans who fled Tibet in 1959, following Chinese aggression. Since 1997, he worked with the Indian Army to provide portable water in Kargil, Dras, Siachen, Galwan, and many other locations in Ladakh, which made him a Guinness World Record holder. In 2010, his concept of Agni Yodhra Lava Energy was adjudged the top 10 innovations by Guardian in World Future Energy Summit in Abu Dhabi. In 2014, he was appointed as the Director of Water and Geothermal Section at the Interna International Sustainable Energy Organization in Geneva. In 2020, he was appointed member of World Water Forum France to develop sustainable water solutions for rural areas. For the last 30 years, he has been collecting fossils from Himachal Pradesh and Ladakh and is now making a Museum of Evolution in Kasoli, Himachal Pradesh. I would now request Dr. Ritesh Arya to take over and commence the session. Thank you. Namaste. I welcome Professor Nigel Hughes, University of California, Robert Spicer, geologist and scientist from India and different parts of the world, attending this second international webinar on Tethys Himalayas, organized by members of Tethys Fossil Museum and Research Center, supported by Indian Geoparks. In. Before starting today's deliberations, I will brief the delegates about the Tethys Fossil Museum and Research Center, which is coming up at Dangari, a small village in Kasoli, Tehsil of Indian Himalaya. The museum is well connected with Chandigarh International Airport via road and rail, and the 90 minutes drives takes you back in geological time from few million years to 200 million years. Geologically, the museum is located on the debris concealing the Dakshai Sabatu boundary which signified the closure of the Tethys Sea and the evolution of terrestrial ecosystem. The museum is built from 20 million years rocks of Kosoli sandstone, beautifully chiseled to give museum an aesthetic look. Water that we drink at the museum is from a borewell drilled into 40 million years old white Kozo sandstone, which is marker bed extending from Pakistan to Burma in the east. Tethys Fossil Museum, as the name suggests, houses fossils collected from different parts of the Tethyan Himalayas. The proposed theme of the museum is evolution and extinction and journey from fossils to fossil fuel. The museum will be repository of various scientific evidences. We will leave bringing the Tethys back to life by displaying collected fossils and rock samples. It will not only cater to the layman, but is likely to enthuse geologist and promote hydrocarbon explorations in the Himalayan region, signifying the gradual evolution of life on this planet and the development of mighty Himalayas. So anyone visiting the museum will have a glimpse of how different fossils collected from various geological formations across the Himalayas can help rebuild the entire paleo history of the various events which led to the evolution and the birth of Himalayas. 
it is as we all know was an ocean once separating india and tibet eurasia as the indian plate moved northward the tethys sea squeezed and when the two plates collided the tethyan sediments were uplifted forming the mighty himalayas a lot of research has been done in timing the collision of the two plates leading to the evolution and the birth of the tethys himalayas but still there is no consensus and there are himalayan opportunities for researchers to come up with a convincing model to time the collision and explain the birth of himalayas keeping this in mind organizing committee of the tethys fossil museum and research center decided to host series of lectures by veteran geologists who dedicated their lives to understand this geomechanism the first among these was professor peter molnar from department of Geo Ge geological sciences university of colorado who explicitly shared his research and story about the growth of himalayas and the tibetan plateau which was attended by more than 100 delegates from india and abroad our today's guest speaker is professor nigel hughes who we just learned uh, was done had done his schooling from chantiniketan and now is from university of california and he will be narrating the journey of the indian subcontinent which took a long voyage northwards for its tryst with destiny when colliding with asia to form the mighty himalayas based on fossil record of cambrian rocks and what it tells about the history of the region so we present professor nigel hughes oh thank you uh ritesh could you just give me the opportunity to share my screen oh but i i can do that now great okay let me just uh find the um yeah the uh the file here and start that up yes okay well thank you very much for this uh, invitation um and you know i'm extremely excited to be uh, have this opportunity to talk um and especially um the idea of the museum because as you'll see in the um later part of the talk uh, geoscience outreach um which is of course what the museum is all about um is very close to um, my interests also in the himalaya um so what i'd like to do today is to talk a little bit about the the very early history um of the north indian margin um and and then talk very briefly about the implication of that for the more recent history when india actually collided with asia and bob spicer is going to uh, speak in this series and uh, he's done extraordinary work um on the the uplift history and using fossils to um to tell us and, and other techniques to tell us about the uplift um history so i i will leave him to uh, uh, to do that um but then i would like to talk a little bit about our various geoscience outreach projects in india um because i know that's the interest of many um in the audience today um so of course just uh, a, a very brief uh, reminder that our planet is uh, very unusual um in that uh, it uh, is an active place um the uh, radioisotopic decay within the earth is generating heat energy our planet is the the right size um to have this process of of plate tectonics which is really getting rid of that heat energy um by cooling the earth's surface down um through the action of of plate tectonics and moving all this this material about and of course um india the indian subcontinent is a a a separate uh, uh entity a separate plate and has this extraordinary history of rapid movement northwards and collision to form the the himalayan mountains um and uh, uh that is all of course related to this process of of just basically the earth letting off steam the earth keeping itself cool uh, primarily by having the uh, old cold sea floor sink down uh, in, uh, uh under the continents and uh, and uh, and be heated up and that um, cools the earth um and uh, keeps the 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 earth stable um and of course uh, as uh, ritesh uh, uh, uh mentioned there um the movement north of uh, of india the most dramatic geological event really uh, of a, a broad tectonic scale um in in the phanerozoic is india's breakneck 
uh, movement forward, 20 centimeters a year at some times, eventually to collide to, uh, to form the Himalayan mountains. Um, but today I want to talk a little bit about the very early history um, of uh, India, when it was part of the uh, continent, the supercontinent of Gondwana land. And you can see here, this is at a time 120 million years ago, where the great um, landmass of Gondwana land, all the southern continents plus India, was already beginning to break up. Uh, the uh, rifting initiated about uh, 180 million years ago from Africa and 120 or so uh, from Antarctica. But Gondwana itself formed much, much earlier um, and around the, the Precambrian Cambrian boundary interval. And so that's a, an interesting reason to look at the world at that particular uh, time. So here's a reconstruction of the world um, as it looked in the, uh, in the Cambrian, our understanding. I'm speaking to you uh, from California here. This particular piece of California, who knows where it was, but uh, the North American continent was very isolated at that uh, time. Uh, and India, of course, um, was a part of, the, uh, of Gondwana. It was lying in an equatorial region of Gondwana. Um, and for our purposes today, the important and interesting thing uh, about India's position is that the present western margin of India was against Africa, the eastern margin was against Antarctica, and it was the northern margin of India, um, the part that now forms the Himalaya, that was the ocean facing margin. And so that is the place where sediments were accumulating, layers of sedimentary rock were, were laid down. Um, and of course, this is now elevated as a result of India's collision with, uh, with Asia. Um, so if we, if we look um, very broadly at India's physiography um, and try and relate this to that history, the peninsular part of India with these sort of brown colors um, is made of extremely ancient rock, uh, thousands of millions of years, pre-Cambrian in age. The Indo-Gangetic plain is uh, to the north of that, where the Ganga and the, uh, uh, the Indus flow. And of course, that's all very recent material, weathering from the Kraton and, and from the Himalaya. Um, and then, of course, there's the Himalaya. Uh, and if one looks uh, at a geological map and the ages of those rocks in the Himalaya, they are primarily in hundreds to tens of millions of years ago. Um, because of that, uh, that history of accumulation of sedimentary rocks on the northern margin of India uh, when it was part of Gondwana. Um, and what I'd like to talk about uh, today in particular is the Cambrian um, and the, how we can use some understanding of the Cambrian to address questions of Himalayan structure. Um, so we've already discussed the fact that um, India has moved northwards and collided with Asia. Um, before India's movement, um, there were other pieces of the northern margin of Gondwana that uh, rifted off. Um, but let's just take a look uh, geologically now at the basic structure of the Himalaya. Um, so what we're going to uh, concentrate on is four major what are called lithotectonic zones. So these are um, units of rock that internally have some consistent characters that are separated by major, major faults, major discontinuities where um, uh, the tectonic forces have forced one set of rocks uh, above another. And the Himalaya are made of four major lithotectonic zones. Um, and for our purposes, um, there's a blue one, the most uh, northerly one is called the Tethian Himalaya, and that has sedimentary rocks in it. Then we go across um, the South Tibet fault system into uh, the red zone, and these are very squashed and deformed rocks. Uh, originally sedimentary or some igneous, some from hot magma inje uh, injected into the Earth's crust, but very deformed and, and uh, uh, squashed during India's collision with Asia. Then to the south of the red zone, we go into uh, what's called the green zone or the lesser Himalaya, and that's back into layers of sedimentary rock, um, uh, hundreds of millions of years old and thousands of millions of years. 
And then into um, another crossing all these faults into the Shivalik Hills, which are, of course, are very famous for uh, uh, your area, um, uh, Ritesh and uh, Doshin. Um, uh, but uh, in, in Pakistan, um, do contain um, some older rocks. And then we're going to talk about uh, going further south onto the Kraton of India itself and visit uh, uh, Dulmera, which is in Rajasthan. And these names that are in squares are places in which Cambrian rock is known. And the thing I'd like to point out is that of all the geological systems, the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Salurana, et cetera, um, uh, in the early history of um, uh, Gondwana land, the Cambrian is the one that has the widest distribution both within these zones and across them. So if we want to understand what the North Indian margin was like prior to India's smashing into Asia, the Cambrian's a really good time because we've got rocks from all these different parts. So what we're gonna to do today is we're going to look at what the uh, nature of these rocks are and some of the geological questions that have been asked about this. And uh, uh, the principal question um, is, I already mentioned that um, India, of course, was part of Gondwana land, but there were some other fragments to the north um, of uh, India. Most of Tibet is made of, of, uh, of pieces that were um, separate from, or separated from the North Indian margin at, uh, at uh, earlier times. And uh, this, uh, th there has been debate about the relationships between these four zones. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, I'm going to show you now a cross section. So this is as if we cut from the south on the left-hand side to the north on the right-hand side across these zones. And uh, you'll, they, you'll see that in the next slide. Um, so here on the, on the left is the south. Um, these are the Cambrian rocks, uh, Dulmeria and Rajasthan. Then we've got the, the um, Shivaliks, uh, the sub-Himalaya, the lesser Himalaya, um, and the red uh, greater Himalaya, and then what's called the Tethian uh, Himalaya. And the point I want to make uh, uh, with this slide is to say that you can see that the um, boundary between the red zone, the greater Himalaya, and the, uh, uh, the green zone, the lesser Himalaya here, is shown as a fault, the main central thrust, but this continues down. And um, actually in this model, the northern two uh, areas are part of a different piece of continental crust. They're, in this model, they're not Indian. They're uh, some kind of exotic material that's not really part of true original India. Um, and this was published in uh, Science, a very prestigious journal in uh, 2000 uh, by Peter Sells and colleagues from Arizona, and sort of supported again in, in 2016 by, by that. And uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the questions that we're going to look at um, and the data that we're going to look at in the next few slides pertains to uh, this argument. What was the argument for this fundamental division of the Himalaya? And how can we examine that argument? Notice that um, uh, not only is, is this uh, a separate piece of crust uh, than India, but also that the blue rocks here are shown as sedimentary rocks deposited in layers on top of an ancient squeezed metamorphic basement. So this is what would be called a basement cover relationship. So um, we'll examine whether that uh, is, uh, is correct too. Um, now, let's talk briefly um, about what the evidence then um, for the DeSalle's model actually was. And this, this concerns um, what's called uh, detrital zircon uh, dating. So imagine that we went to the beach and um, uh, gathered some sand grains. Most of the grains would be uh, the mineral quartz, silica. But within uh, the sand, there would be very likely some grains of a very hard mineral called zircon. And zircon forms um, from uh, molten material injected into the Earth's crust in an igneous rock. Um, it's very, very hard. Um, it uh, receives a radioisotopic date when it forms. 
Um, and um, because it's very hard, zircons can withstand multiple times of being uplifted, eroded, washed down a mountain, um, uh, put back into the ocean, forming a sedimentary layer as a sandstone. That sandstone might itself be uplifted in another cycle. But because zircons are so hard, they resist uh, erosion um, and they can endure for multiple samples. So um, what we could do is we could go to the sand from the beach and collect the zircon grains, date their ages, and that would say something about the source material that is bringing the sand into the region. It obviously has to have sources that reflect the ages of those particular grains. So that's one thing that the, the, the zircons uh, can tell us. And the other thing that they can tell us is that if we look at a sandstone as opposed to a sand on the beach, um, the, the uh, profile of ages of the detrital zircons can tell us something about the maximum, the maximum depositional age. So let me just run through this diagram. This is the most complicated diagram in the, in the talk, I assure you, but it is important to understanding what the scientific question we've been looking at is. So um, what is this diagram? Um, on the uh, uh, axis along the bottom here is the age of the grains from um, 400 million years ago, 0.4 billion years ago, way back to 3.6 billion years ago. And um, on the uh, y-axis, uh, the vertical axis, is uh, the frequency of grains of this age. So you can see that there, in this sample, there are a lot of grains that are about 500 million years old. And then there are some that are 900 million years old, etc. cetera. Um, so what we can say is that this sandstone must be younger than the age of the youngest zircons. It could be much younger than the age of the youngest zircons, but it can't be older. This could not be a sandstone that formed, say, 600 million years ago, because it's got lots of grains that are 500 million years old within it. So when you look at these profiles, just looking at these three profiles, you can see that the top one and the bottom one look pretty similar to each other. And the, the one from the green zone, the lesser Himalaya, the little to the south, is markedly different. And this was the basis for the Decelles argument that the northern parts of the Himalaya had a different origin. Well, um, that's a, an interesting uh, uh, suggestion, but what is the age in which these sandstones formed? Well, they actually mentioned this in their paper. Uh, they said that the sandstone um, that this sample was of detrital zircons was taken from was deposited some 1.5 billion years ago. So that's about here. So there's no possibility that this sample could have younger grains within it because the sample is 1.5 billion years old. So it can't have any grains younger than that within it. So this is where paleontology becomes really useful to us because fossils give us the independent way of dating the age of the rocks that we're comparing. Um, and so what we did um, in the early part of the 2000s was to compare um, the, uh, the uh, um, rocks, sandstones collected from Cambrian rocks, because as I said, the Cambrian is very widespread. And in fact, we have very good control even within the Cambrian. So we can compare rocks that were deposited within just a few million years of one another um, and see their zircon grains. And when we do, what you see, I think, is very obvious. And that is that within the green zone, Cambrian rocks have lots of young zircons, very much in the same way as the red zone has and the, the blue zone is. Has. So um, in our view, then, um, this argument for a profound difference pertains to within the green zone and relates to the depositional age of the, of the rock. Well, of course, um, De Sells and, and colleagues didn't quite like that idea, but we'll, we'll go on to discuss this a little, bit, a little bit further. But now I'd like to get away from that technical part 
um, and just talk a little bit about the, um, the, the, the experience of working in the Himalaya. So, of course, um, one of the first things that uh, one has to do uh, in a kind of study of this kind, trying to really understand the history of one particular unit of time to be able to interpret others, is to go back to the original collections that were made um, and uh, this is a, a trilobite fossil that was collected by officers of the GSI um, in, the, in the 1980s. Um, we've used a computer here to try and what's called retro deform, because of course in the Himalaya, even in the blue zone and green zone where the sedimentary rocks are preserved, the fossils are still squashed. So this is what's called retro deformation, trying to restore the original shape. And you can see that perhaps that this isn't a very well-preserved trilobite, but it is a trilobite, uh, red lichia with the, the head region here and the segments. Um, and, uh, um, and we can compare this with other forms known from around the world. And so I, I've had the privilege of spending a long time in the Geological Survey of India in Kolkata, um, uh, looking at fossils like that. This was an interesting story, at least interesting for us. Of course, um, the, the, the northern region, the blue zone, the Tethian Himalaya was um, uh, originally surveyed in uh, the uh, uh, 1890s, late 1890s. And this was a fossil that was described um, as a, a, a particular type of, of sponge. Um, and when I, I looked at this fossil, I thought um, uh, that doesn't look like any kind of sponge that I've any knowledge of. And I must admit that I thought that it might be actually just a, a sort of strange pyrite concretion um, that had weathered away. But I did notice some of these other features and uh, this shell here, this is a brachiopod. So I made a, I made a cast of this uh, and brought it back um, uh, to, uh, to Riverside and recast that. And you can see that actually it has a very regular pattern um, of these kind of radiating lines. And then there are these funny sort of um, uh, tunnel-like uh, structures, and there's the, the, the brachiopod fossil. And, and I suddenly realized that, that this actually is India's, um, well, the, the Himalayas first example of a soft-bodied animal from the, uh, from the Cambrian. Um, this is what's called an Eldonid, well known from the Burgess Shale of Canada and from um, the Chenjiang deposits of, of Kunming, a strange animal, um, it, some think related to echinoderms, uh, sea urchins, um, and uh, with this radiating um, kind of body plan. And what actually sort of cements this is that these are often known with brachiopods attached. And when they settle on the sea floor, they become targets for scavengers um, who uh, make these burrows as they're going through mining the, the soft tissues. And that's exactly what we see in that specimen. So just to make the point that it's very important to look at the uh, previously collected material um, and interpret it in, in, in new lights. But of course, the exciting thing is to go to the Himalayas. Uh, and um, um, we thought we were kind of adventurous doing this. This is a, 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 a Dr. Parcher from the Wadia Institute crossing the Barahia River by coat hanger. Um, of course, um, we were put in our place when we saw what had to happen to the poor animals that were, uh, uh, were coming with us. But this is a spectacular place to do field work. The exposure of the rocks in the rain shadow is just phenomenal. Um, this is the whole uh, lower Paleozoic succession from the Cambrian up to the Devonian Muth Port site. Um, we've been working mainly on these rocks, the, the, the darker color rocks with the orange uh, band in um, that are Cambrian, and then we have an unconformity with the Ordovician. Uh, very classical work, climbing up the sides of the uh, mountains, um, uh, banging on the, the rocks with a hammer. Um, I'm not smoking a cigarette there, this is uh, a pencil, um, but uh, collecting fossils um, and, uh, and then um, preparing and describing them. So many different types of fossils, small shelly fossils, um, these are uh, spines that, uh, of an animal um, that would have looked a little bit like a cactus with spines sticking out, named after uh, Diraj Banerjee, um, uh, brachiopods uh, here, uh, but mostly, of course, trilobites. And uh, I just put this picture, this is not an Indian trilobite, but I put it in to just 
um, show you that what we mainly find are the disconnected or disarticulated pieces of the trilobite shell. So here are many uh, head regions, parts of the central head region of um, uh, 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 a trilobite. Prachina here, as you all know, of course, meaning old. Um, this is the earliest example of this particular genus. Um, and, you know, it is a privilege to be able to work there and to uh, honor some of the great um, uh, geologists who have uh, uh, also contributed uh, in these areas and other people that we, that we admire. This is a, a dear friend from Shantanukech and Chamali Prestigir. Um, and I don't want to go into all the details of the uh, layers and, and the, the, the strata that we've, we've worked on. Um, but together with a revision of previously done work and our new work, we've been able to create a uh, stratigraphy of the Himalaya for the, the, the Cambrian that can be correlated with that of other parts of, of the world with confidence now. Um, and I think that's, that's something that's been um, somewhat um, useful to be able to do. It's nice that India now has, a, 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 for the Cambrian as a nation that can be uh, compared around the world. But I'd like to um, try and tell you more about the sort of implications of this, because that's much more interesting than the names of fossils or something of that kind. So um, this is a, a famous uh, uh, place for trekkers, um, uh, Puktal Gompa in Zanskar in, the, um, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, Ladakh. Um, and um, you can see uh, that if you look at the rocks here, We've got uh, a, a long uh, series of exposures here of sort of darker sandstones and shales with occasional red beds. And then we've got a, a very prominent wall of red limestone or dolomite. This is famous Pukval Gompa, and it's built into that, um, that yellowy uh, red colored uh, limestone dolomite band that's, that's um, um, uh, called the Kasha Formation. And uh, we don't need to talk too much about the details here, except to say that we've got lots of trilobites in these rocks that tell us the age um, of uh, the deposition of the rocks, both be immediately below that uh, limestone band and, uh, and above it. Um, and I'd just like you to remember, if you would, this sequence of about 250 meters of um, dolomite or limestone, carbonate rocks, over a very thick sequence of sands and shales. Because if we go along the Himalaya, uh, uh, several uh, um, uh, hundreds of kilometers, we can see this mountain here, and this is of course Sagamatha or Chumulumba, or also known as Everest, um, from the north side. And the very top of Everest is made of Ordovician uh, limestones. We'll talk about that at the end of the talk. Um, but uh, beneath it, we have a rather striking unit called the yellow band that is about 250 meters thick. And it lies above the Everest series, which is many thousands of meters of thick of sandstones and uh, shales, now schist, because these rocks um, the, the dark rocks, the Everest series, and the, uh, these limestones are strongly deformed. They are not sedimentary rocks. They have become metamorphic rocks. Yet the signature of these rocks seems very similar. Sands and shales that are thick, and then 250 meters of, of carbonate. Now, there's no chance of looking for trilobites in these rocks because they're too squashed. But there is one thing we can do, and that is to use the detrital zircons, which um, can be obtained uh, uh, from these rocks, even though they've been deformed. And so in the next slide, I'm going to show you the uh, age spectra of the uh, zircons that we get from the trilobite bearing rocks just below uh, Pukdal Gompa. So we know that they're Cambrian because they've got the trilobites in and um, rocks that were collected just at the boundary between the yellow um, band here and the Everest series. Luckily, these rocks dip down to the north, so we sampled them at 18,000 feet instead of 27, um, 
but uh, geologically, I have climbed Everest, if not um, uh, in, uh, in, in reality. But there you are, this is the, this is the contact uh, uh, zone between these two. And the summit pyramid of uh, Everest is made of Ordovician uh, limestones that are not deformed. We'll talk about that later. But here um, then is the comparison of these uh, detrital zircon uh, profiles, one from the trilobite bearing rocks um, that are, uh, are uh, shown in the blue zone here, and the other um, from just below the yellow band. And what I, uh, I hope I can convince you of is that these profiles are very, very similar to one another. But remember, in the DeSales model, the blue material should all be younger than the red material because um, it's supposed to be an ancient basement that is then um, succeeded by layers of sedimentary rock on top of it. Well, that is not supported by these distributions because the age of the youngest zircons in both of these is, is the same. This rock um, must have formed um, uh, sometime after 500 million years. And when we look at the stratigraphy, we see that they're the same. It's just that basically the fault that separates the blue zone and the red zone has cut to a higher level in the rock series when we go further to the east. So that's um, a, a, a difference of opinion then with the DeSales model uh, on that. Uh, and so that's uh, our comparison then of the, the blue zone and the red zone. We don't uh, accept this basement cover relationship. And now let's talk about the, these areas down here uh, and see uh, what their story uh, tells us. When uh, we do the same thing, go to places where there are Cambrian fossils, take samples of sandstones and look at um, the, the sedimentology, what they say about the depositional conditions, and also um, look at their detrital zircons. So now very briefly, we're going to look at the, the uh, lesser Himalaya, the green zone, the yellow zone, and then um, at the orange zone, which is south of the Himalayas on the, the Indian shield itself. And the first thing I'd like to point out is that the rocks that are occurring in the south are thinner and they're near shore deposits, whereas those that occur further to the north are much thicker, um, Cambrian succession, um, and uh, deeper water uh, kind of situation. It's all relatively shallow, but we can clearly see that those that are on the Indian continent are shallower than those to the north. So this looks like what we would expect in a normal deepening margin that just gets a little bit deeper as we go to the north. And then when we look at the detrital zircon grain spectra, there are some differences, but I just like to point out that all these rocks that are Cambrian and that we know are Cambrian from the fossils they contain, all of them have lots of young zircons um, within them. So um, DeSells and, and, and colleagues argument against our view that they've maintained is that what we were seeing as part of the green zone, that they considered a little bit of really the northern material that had been thrust to the south. Well, there is lots of thrusting that goes on, but this material was never thrust anywhere. This is part of the Indian shield. Um, uh, and, uh, and so you can't explain uh, these detrital zircons by um, a piece of the northern material being introduced um, because this has just not gone anywhere. Um, this is all part of a continuous margin that was deepening to the northwards in the, um, uh, at, that, at that time. Uh, and so um, if we put all the uh, uh, information that we have together, and this is summarizing a huge amount of, uh, of, uh, of work very quickly, um, uh, we see that the ancient northern margin of India, um, uh, like any passive margin succession, um, uh, shows changes from shallower conditions uh, onshore to um, uh, more uh, uh, marginal conditions as we, as we go deeper, there are some differences. Um, these differences in the rock types are very important for uh, understanding something of the later uplift and erosional history of the, uh, the Himalayan mountains. And um, what uh, I would like to just mention very uh, briefly in passing 
um, is that, uh, as you, I'm sure you know, when India collided with Asia, um, of course, these faults started to, to form in order to accommodate that shortening. As India um, moves northwards, the, the mountains get crumpled and they break. And there's a series of major faults, those four major faults form in series, the, the most northerly one uh, first, and then when enough material has been piled up, they break to the south and there's another rupture, uh, a new fault forms further to the south. Well, the um, understanding the original geometry of the, the, the margin of India before India collided with Asia is very helpful to our understanding of the materials that were uplifted and what times they were uplifted, and then the history of their erosion. And um, Bob is going to talk, speak about uplift history, so um, I don't want to be too technical uh, uh, about this. And I'm going to move on now um, to talk uh, about um, the geoscience outreach work that we've been privileged to do. So um, as Ritesh um, mentioned at the, at the beginning, um, I had a very uh, happy uh, eight months as a student in Shantaniketan um, many years ago. And uh, as you know, Shantaniketan is Tagore's university or arts uh, focus. And I made many friends there. Uh, and, um, and, and so um, as a, a guest in India, um, uh, I wanted to do something that um, shared our interest in the geological history. Um, so this was, and, and, and Bob Spicer may remember, if, uh, I'm sure he doesn't, but um, by very early days, I, I actually was, was, was a would-be paleobotanist um, and, uh, and thought about doing PhDs in, in paleobotany. Um, so, um, um, so I've always actually had a, a soft spot for paleobotany. Um, and, um, and so this is a, a, a story um, about fossils um, that occur in the area that I was at, uh, at college in. Um, so it's called Monisha Patore Bon, Monisha and the Stone uh, Forest, because like many parts of India, India is very rich in this material, fossilized wood or petrified wood, or in Bengali, Gach Patore. Um, and uh, it's a remarkable material that looks just like wood, but it's made of stone. Um, and so this is something that, you know, people who live in the rural, uh, uh, communities know. Um, if you are in the city, you wouldn't know this, but uh, if you're in the, uh, the, the, the rural parts of India, fossil wood is very common in, in many parts of many different ages, and it's recognized. People obviously know that there's something special about this. Um, so this is my favorite tea shop, Gosha Dokan, uh, and uh, there's a takur here um, being uh, revered um, and dressed with flowers every day. Because in Hindu tradition, um, in Bengal, this is interpreted as um, the bones of the Bok Ashur, um, the, uh, the stork demon that uh, beam um, uh, slaves in the Mahabharata. Uh, um, uh, now, there are tradition uh, stories in, in uh, Muslim tradition involving a local saint, Pir Kamani Baba, and there are Adivasi stories too for how this um, strange material comes to be. Um, but in our story, uh, we have about an 11 year old girl, Monisha, uh, and uh, her interest is to find a natural explanation for this remarkable uh, material. So she has a whole series of um, uh, adventures. Here she is up a tree as a tube well is being, um, is being sunk in the, in the village. Um, uh, she's taken to the, or she goes to the hot springs at Bokrasha. Um, she takes her mother, her grandmother into the into the pool of hot water, which is a new experience for her grandmother. Um, uh, uh, her grandmother slips and Monisha grabs the post, as you can see here. She gets a splinter, she takes the splinter out and it turns into grains of sand because of course this is being solidified in the hot brine uh, filled waters um, uh, that are occurring in the, in the hot springs. And she begins therefore to understand how this transformation from um, uh, from uh, wood into, into stone can occur. Um, she gets uh, wet, uh, for her shari is wet, of course, from being in the, in the uh, kunda, uh, and um, she gets a fever, and in her feverous state, she's visited by a hati, except that it's not a hati, it's a gomphothir. 
um, and uh, uh, a gonfothea from the Maya Pliocene boundary. And the gonfothea takes her um, on a, a voyage back in time uh, uh, to meet all the other animals that were living at that, uh, at that interval. So Shibotherium, a Jolahushti with the nostrils pointing down, not up. And Monisha begins to realize that this is a testament of the, the time um, when these animals were alive. And she gets chased by, of course, a saber tooth cat um, and um, uh, has a, a dramatic uh, uh, culmination of the story and the fever breaks and she comes back, but with the light of science in her eyes um, to tell the story of a natural way in which um, this curious material can occur and what she knows and what she's learned uh, about the, the, the prehistory um, of, that, uh, of that region. Well, we had a, a fantastic time doing programs um, in various um, schools and learning centers and uh, SSKs and things in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the area. Um, um, uh, I was able to take two students from UCR, um, happily, um, uh, uh, two ladies here, happily one was Muslim, one, uh, uh, one Hindu. Um, talking here about the differences between modern elephants and the, the gomphotheas. Um, it, you know, it's great for the children, of course, they're so wonderful in India, so engaged and fascinated and, you know, it's just pleasure to uh, interact. Um, we were very happy that uh, a, a play was made of the, um, of the, uh, the story and it toured quite widely. We were able to ship books uh, to Bangladesh too. So uh, there were programs done in, in both West Bengal and, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Bangladesh. Um, and uh, about a year later, we did a follow-up um, to see what the impact of the book had been um, and wrote a paper about this in the Journal of Geoscience Education. And what we found um, was interesting to us. Um, that was that if the story was read to the children, they had no problem understanding. Um, but to read the story, even though literacy amongst uh, uh, males is, is you know, 70, 72 percent or something um, in, in, in West Bengal and, and I think 67 um, and amongst women, um, the level of reading comprehension necessary to understand the story, even though it could be understood perfectly if read out loud, was um, was a challenge. Um, and so that is what has uh, promoted um, our um, latest adventure. Uh, and uh, this is a, 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 an idea that is, uh, um, well, I'm very pleased to say it's just made a big step forward yesterday. Um, uh, and this is to tell that story um, of India's migration northwards. Because I remember my first introduction to geology was a television program that I saw at a friend's house when I was about 10 years old, and it was an early um, representation, an uh, early program on what was called the new global tectonics. And that was the idea, of course, that the earth is made of plates and that the plates move around. And I remember clearly to this day, a, a, a cartoon of India colliding with Asia to make the Himalayas. And that visual story is something that is very easy to transmit, but it's, it's a magnificent story. It's a huge scale. It's the whole earth. Um, and yet it can be transmitted relatively simply in an animation. So as you can see here, we've already shown this picture of India's movement, you know, 20 centimeters a year at its fastest movement. Um, the, uh, uh, you can see this series of um, uh, reconstructions here. Imagine them as the sequence of, a, of shots in, a, in an animation. And so, um, what we've had the idea to do is to tell the story of um, the migration of the Indian subcontinent, that magnificent story, um, through the various exciting fossil characters. And of course, because I'm, I'm a trilobite uh, specialist, we have to have trilobites. So our story is called in English, uh, The Ocean on Top of Our Mountain. And it's about, of course, the fact that the top of Sagamatha um, is composed of Ordovician limestones, and that in those limestones um, live various animals and trilobites, of course. Uh, and so in our story, um, a, a, a trilobite is collected by um, a climber, um, Captain Shipra Mojumda, who was one of the first Indian ladies to climb um, Sagamatha. 
uh, and um, uh, given to uh, a girl, uh, a village girl. And uh, we've had Monisha in uh, the previous story. So this girl is called Nushrat. Uh, so uh, Gujushuti, who is the rolled up trilobite, unrolls and comes back to uh, life um, and uh, takes um, uh, Nushrat on a, on a journey um, uh, uh, to visit other uh, exciting uh, uh, members of India's fossil past as India migrates northwards. Um, so, uh, of course, we have to talk about the wonderful uh, dinosaurs in Madhya Pradesh uh, and the all sorts of uh, uh, exciting stories of Rajasaurus and uh, Isaiosaurus and, uh, and things that are, are known in that part. And that is, of course, during the time when India was um, isolated and uh, uh, moving northwards uh, as, it, uh, as it progressed uh, on its journey. Um, and uh, so we've got to think about uh, that a little bit. I'll show you another animation in a moment. And then, of course, as India collides with Asia um, and the Himalayas start to be uh, rise, the Fallen Basin sinks. And in that um, uh, situation, which is becoming progressively more aquatic, one of the most beautiful series of, of uh, uh, transitional, um, uh, uh, transitional fossils occurs, and that is um, the fossils that show us that the totally aquatic group of whales today um, have ancestors uh, amongst terrestrial artiodactyls. So this is part of this beautiful series of, of fossils uh, that occur from 48 to 40 uh, million years ago. Uh, we know their whales by the structure of their ear um, and the way that that's adapted, especially for hearing underwater. But of course, no whale uh, today has uh, terrestrially adapted legs like this. None of them have um, the astragalus bone that tells us um, that the animals which we know are whales from their ears um, were originally artiodactyl ungulates um, uh, related to deer and, and pigs and, and those kinds of of animals. And we see, of course, this, this fabulous series of, of transition. We even see the genes that are um, still present uh, in, in dolphins uh, for making the bat legs, but they've been down-regulated now because, of course, this is a totally uh, aquatic group. And so um, our story uh, takes advantage of a very happy kind of coincidence. Um, uh, and that is um, um, that, of course, um, uh, uh, the, the locations of these fossils that I've been mentioning to you just happily lie along the same lines as uh, Kalidasha's um, magnificent poem, the Meghdutha. Uh, and as you know, in that, the, the Aksha is, uh, is separated from his lover who's in the Himalaya and asks the cloud to send a message of love um, uh, to, to her and describe all the places that the cloud passes over um, from, uh, from Madhya Pradesh uh, up uh, to the Himalaya. But it takes an interesting route. If you look at the route the, the cloud takes, it actually goes strongly to the Northeast and then heads to the Northwest. So it covers all these, these, uh, these places. And, and so in our story, Nushrat and, uh, um, and Bhutishuti travel on a cloud and look down on the various fossils that are occurring um, in these, these regions. They look down so they don't interfere with what's going on. Um, but of course, in our story, it's, it's, uh, it's not the cloud that's the messenger, it's India. It's the subcontinent of India moving, as Ritesh said, northwards for its tryst with destiny to form the Himalaya and um, create the greatest mountain uh, chain in, uh, on, on the earth. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's the, the story that we're happy, hoping to tell. So just like um, uh, Kalidash would have written in Talpata Lippi, um, the, the layers of each Talpata telling uh, the story of the, the Meghdut. So the, uh, the rock layers of India tell us the, the real story of the, the, the subcontinent's origin, a story that can be shared by everybody uh, from the subcontinent and even uh, Bideshis too uh, can uh, take pleasure in this, in this incredibly dramatic and exciting uh, uh, um, history. Uh, so um, we, we, we have produced, and I'm going to show you um, uh, what's called a teaser for this, uh, this series. And yesterday, um, I'm very happy to say that we heard that we have been um, generously uh, funded by the, uh, 
um, the AAPG, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, who, um, which will help us greatly in making a series of 10 um, uh, times 10 minute um, videos telling the, uh, the story that in English will be called uh, um, the ocean on top of our mountain. But we intend to make it in, in Hindi, Urdu and Bengali and hopefully also South Indian uh, language too. And I'm just going to f close with showing you the, the teaser. Um, this is done by incredibly talented uh, people, Sheka Mukherjee at the um, National Institute of Design of Vijaywara, uh, and Trisha Banerjee in particular, um, who uh, uh, runs Drishtikon uh, Art House. Um, I should say that this um, teaser is very much aimed at trying to get funding to make this. And so it is a little bit um, uh, westernized. We would like to make this a deshi, uh, have many deshi touches to this. Um, we would like to use um, Indian music as well. Um, uh, and um, uh, the, there are uh, one or two uh, geologically inaccurate things. The dinosaurs look rather North American. Um, and uh, 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 there's also a little bit of a tectonic issue at the end uh, of it. And I should also say that I have no control over the size of which my name is shown. Um, in, in, in this. Um, uh, this is very much a, a, an effort that we consider very much, um, you know, out of Rabindranath's legacy at Shantana Gaitan, artists and scientists coming together. We, you know, just like the, the, the museum, you know, there is this history that we as professionals are so fortunate to, to know of, but it's a history that every person from the subcontinent can be proud of and and, and, and can share together. So um, here is the, uh, I hope it works, but here is the, the, the teaser for the ocean on top of our mountain. The top of the Sagar Matha wasn't always a high mountain. Long, long ago, it was the bottom of an ancient ocean. At that big storm came, the sea floor was closed. we want to meet someone special who has been in this place far longer than anyone else. Really? It doesn't look very special to me. You think? that these mountains have always been here, don't you, Nishra? Of course, they have. The earth story is much longer than the story of all the people who have ever lived on it. Let's learn to meet the bears of the box. To meet those who lived in India during that epic voyage. of our subcontinent's past, which belongs to each one of us. Get ready for Kittishiti and Mishra in the ocean on the top of our mountain to take you on to the true adventure of 100 crore lifetimes. Well, there we go. Um, that is the, uh, uh, the end of my presentation. Um, and I'd be very happy to uh, try and answer any questions that uh, uh, anybody has. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Nigel. It was just a wonderful presentation. I must say uh, the way you have explained the Indian movement right from Cambrian times when it was with part of Gondwana and how it moved with the uh, with 
with the uh, tri trilobites and the Cambrian fossils and with the dinosaurs and then culminating with the collision and uh, leading to the evolution of the Himalayas. So in, in, the, in the entire talk, you had just mentioned about the Indian culture, your association with Shanti Niketan, and the best thing is you still continued that relationship now and have just worked out so well the last presentation of uh, yours uh, in the form of a video which says that if we can just make some small videos and popularize uh, geology, paleontology especially, by telling stories in local language, uh, you made some comics, storylines, and then in those storylines, not only fossils, not only evolution was discussed, it was groundwater, mm -hmm. it was hot springs, the geothermal energy. So entire thing, you know, in totality, without uh, actually telling something so big word about geology and then confusing the student or the children, you have just tried, showed the way that how simple things can be told very simply to the children in a story manner, and they use it every day in the vicinity and uh, everything works out so well. So, well, I, yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, I, I, just, I just, you know, this idea of what is called place-based education, you know, mm -hmm. concentrate on um, places that people know, you know, things that they're, that they're familiar with. Mm -hmm. And so when I decided to write that story, all I could write about was what, what I was familiar with. Mm -hmm. So these are the places, that on my um, evenings, I would go for a cycle ride into the villages of Bengal. And I had you know, friends in, in villages and Baal singers and, and, and things. So, um, you know, I was privileged to get some connection. Um, and, and of course, if you can try to connect um, to the experience of, of local people, um, you know, everybody's incredibly bright in India. It's, it's just a question of opportunity and, um, and, um, uh, and, and and sort of um, outlook. Uh, so, and so uh, this is this is I think the key. Hmm. So this is this is like this is this is, this has to be done, you know. And I'm glad that uh, when we were recording your session last time, you you were just not sure about the funds, and then we, we would have missed this video clip. Again. I, well, I <laughs> so uh, so now you're yeah. lucky that lucky that you uh, showed. Uh, you got the funds, and now the production is on, and everything works very well for the, for the we, children, we, you know, we, for the benef benefit of the children. AAPG has generously given us uh, given us a, a good start. It's not we don't have the whole funding yet, but um, they they will help us uh, uh, with this considerably, and um, you know we are extremely grateful to them. And I should say that APG India has been you know important, and uh, um, and other other uh, societies too. Um, so uh, this is, you know, it, it, this is you know, a story that everybody who's who loves the subcontinent, you know, should be excited <laughs> about. And, uh, yes, and it, it's it's such a fascinating um, fascinating yeah. feast, you know, uh, moving from from the from the Gondwana land, and uh, moving like an island, moving from the trilobites to the dinosaurs, how they evolved independently, and then uh, then they just collide, and lead to the evolution of the Himalayas and in between we have the Deccan volcanism. So everything in place for a total megastar blockbuster, uh, <laughs> I, I must say, uh, uh, video series, I think what, what you're making. So I, I, I wish you all uh, the best. Yeah. Well, thank you. I should just say to Oshin, sorry, this, the, that red line, um, I, I, somebody else other than me created yeah it. yeah i understand because when we Peter apologize was watching, for that yeah I, I, yeah sorry i don't know and i don't know how to get ready we're trying to stuff. figure out how that happened uh, we apologize yeah, no, to no, the no. viewers who, who had like difficulties in understanding yeah. things if at all it happened but we tried our best to kind of fix no, that i think uh, someone has done it uh, intentionally i think in peter peter's talks also this was done but that is uh, we'll try to figure out who has I done it, it now. Yeah, yeah, anyway, right. um, uh, okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, but I, I think Robert Spicer, <laughs> Mr. Robert Spicer has something to say. Okay. Should we... 
get him on board. Yes. All right. I think Aaron was first, actually. So um, oh, yes. if oh, we yes. don't mind, yes. Aaron can go yes. first, and then I will ask my question. Yeah, I'm a, a no question. I just uh, feel very nostalgic uh, yes. meeting uh, Nigel uh, digitally. <laughs> Earlier we used to meet in the field, <laughs> Spiti yes, and Masuri. Yeah, I say, but uh, it's a great uh, to see your experiments with the outreach, and uh, oh, it's a it's a lesson for those who believe that uh, paleontology is kept in the ivory towers and it need not go to down to the grassroots uh, schools and streets. In fact, the geological tragedy of India is that hardly 5% of the universities and colleges teach geology. And uh, most of the people, even in the universities, confuse between geology and zoology. Uh, and I believe no nation can become rich and affluent if it has a poor focus on earth sciences and environmental sciences. In fact, uh, I've been all the time talking, my uh, outreach talks, I, in fact, uh, I have a YouTube channel, Earth Talks. I speak in Hindi largely. And uh, mm -hmm. e even today, 75 years after independence, uh, many colleagues uh, they say, why you speak Hindi? Uh, I said, you cannot educate this big country without using local languages. I, I'm so happy that you use Bangla for talking to those kids and you try to reach out to both the Bengals and you talked of other Indian languages. Uh, I'm sure if they did not listen to Indians, they'll listen to Nigel and keep on doing it. Uh, as you said, you're not uh, an Indian geologist, but you are a geologist from India. So welcome and uh, great, keep it up. So happy to uh, hear you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I, you know, I, I do, uh, you know, um, feeling that I'm you know, part of a community of people interested in Indian geology, you know, is, is very important. Um, and thank you, Arun. Yeah. And we have Mr. Robert Spicer say something. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Nigel, I enjoyed the talk very much. Um, I have a couple of comments and then a question. Yeah. Uh, first comment is, um, it's not everybody who, who shows Peter the Cells to be wrong. So, uh, <laughs> well done on that front. That's quite an achievement. <laughs> well, yes. As you know, Pete, Peter has got a, a huge uh, experience of working in the uh, the Himalaya Tibetan region. So, um, yeah. uh, no, and, and I, 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 I agree I, with you. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, I should say, you know, um, it, yeah, ab absolutely. Peter is a marvelous um, um, sort of you know, strat stratigraphic tectonic geologist who's worked, you know, over many many. Um, uh, uh, different origins and and a lot in the Himalayas and done brilliant work um, and 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 you know I have to say that you know having a controversy like this has been you know wonderful for us because this is the sort of thing you can write a grant proposal about um, and um, um, and uh, and so this this um, this controversy I think has been um, you know stimulating actually uh um for um you know, learning learning more but also for being able to you know get the resources to do that so this is not of course a yeah um, well, what uh, it what it shows yeah. nicely is that a combined approach of using fossils and other geological data is really essential for yeah. answering a lot of these questions um and your your um your reference back to the television program I think it was in the early 60s, and I think I remember watching it as well. Um, <laughs> I think it was it, Horizon. Horizon, yeah. yeah it was a really That's it. Horizon. Yeah. If yeah. anybody wants to, to know any more about the early history of the thinking of behind plate tectonics, there's an excellent book called The Dark Side of the Earth by Robert Muir Wood. Uh, it's quite old now, but it does go back into that, his, that early history, and it, it's excellent. The other thing about the, the talk that I really enjoyed um, relating to the outreach was that story about the hot springs, uh, because I remember um, going all through the Himalaya and across Tibet in the Tatupani 
sampling uh, helium-3 mm. to get the signatures of what was going on deep inside the Earth. And uh, that was a, a very fond memory. But my, my question is, you said when India collided with Eurasia, but you were very careful not to put a date on that. <laughs> and I was wondering when you think that oh, time was. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, fortunately, the, 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 um, um, uh, I'm going to punt on this question, of course, because it's, uh, <laughs> because actually I really don't, you know, none of the work that I am involved in bears directly on, on that issue. Um, what, what, the, the, just to sort of outline where I, um, you know, if this were a, 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 a talk where I was going in to try and talk more about the implications of the uplift, what um, uh, our, our work there is um, related really to events long after co initial collision, um, but with the, the, the sequence of the breaking to the south faults. And particularly the history of the main boundary thrust um, and the, the tons thrust. And the, um, uh, our argument is, and I'll try and make this very brief, um, that there's a change and you, I mean, now I'm on dangerous ground because this is your territory, uh, Bob, but there is a big change in osmium and strontium isotopes at 16 million years in the world's oceans. And, you know, when one looks for a, you know, big signal like that. Is it something about global weathering or is it something, you know, uh, a local source um, that could have a global in influence? And of course the Himalaya being at low latitude, um, uh, you know, enormous um, uh, erosion going into the oceans. But people don't really um, think about what happened tectonically 16 million years ago in the, in, in the Himalaya because the main boundary thrust seems to initiate at 11 million years and the main central thrust long before that. So there's nothing that happens at 16 million years that is terribly exciting, except that um, uh, uh, we, we would argue that, um, that the, the, there's, an, um, there's the tons thrust uh, um, initiated at that point. And this brought up um, to the surface um, the Cambrian Tal formation, uh, which Arun has worked on uh, extensively in Dirajdar and people, which was full of radiogenic osmium. And so we've had a couple of papers that I have been peripherally involved in, um, but uh, uh, have, have modeled um, if the Tal formation was continuous across the Himalaya, as I think there's every reason to think it originally was, and it was uplifted, could uh, at that time, could that be the source of this enrichment of osmium, which occurs at that time. And, um, and the, the, the modeling that we've done suggests that it, it, it could. Um, and the real point that I'd like to make about this is today there is just remnants of this tile material in a few scattered places. But, um, uh, and so people don't pay any attention because as a source, it seems too minor. But that's because it's been uplifted and eroded. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's, it's the stuff that's gone. Um, so, you know, what we need to do is to reconstruct what the margin was like um, uh, and when this material was exposed, uh, uh, because, uh, you know, this we would argue is the material that's all gone into the oceans to make that signature. So um, that would be the, you know, so I'm sorry that, you know, for your question, I, you know, I've, I've witnessed you know, interesting discussions of this at the at the uh, at the Himalayan uh, workshops, um, uh, but I, I have no you know no we have no yeah. bearing of um, our stuff on that. Yeah, well, thank you. It was a bit of a trick question. Um. <laughs> yes. yeah, well, I, you can see, I tricked my but way I, out. I, I, <laughs> I like the I like the osmium story very much, um, and uh, fifteen sixteen is very 
significant for me because I think that is when the height of the Himalaya as a significant barrier exceeded for the first time the height of the Gangdizi, which sits immediately mm. to the north of the Himalaya. Yeah. And, and that had a major inf- impact on, on uh, regional airflows, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I'll use yeah. the M word monsoon, but it's, uh, it's a very dangerous to, word to use. Um, yeah. but on, on the one last point, are you based in Riverside? In you, are you in the office right now or not? No, I'm at, at home. Um, okay, because uh, yeah. in the morning. department at the moment, it... visiting at Riverside yeah. with Andy Ridgewell is Paul Valdez, who does a lot right. of the climate modelling on Tibet. So right. if you get the chance, yeah. have a word. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you, Bob. Yes, I will. I will. I'll be, you will be going. We are back now um, teaching so in person. So I'll, I'll do that. Um, yeah, send your, your, your best wishes. So, okay. Yeah, thank you. Very nice to see you. Likewise. So we have Professor Ashok Sani with us. Oh. Sani, sir, uh, you, uh, sir, you, uh, Namaskar, sir. Sir, can you hear me? Uh, I, I, I think now. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Please, sir. Absolutely. Hello, Nigel. How are you? Hello, Noshka Ashok. <laughs> so I really enjoyed your talk. Thank and, you. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, I, I think the series that uh, Ritesh Arya has started is very good for all of us, you know, because uh, one thing this COVID thing has done, that it's brought experts all over the world to our doorsteps. Sir, uh, can think, you just put your video on? No, I don't. <laughs> no, I think this is fine, if you can hear me. Okay. Yes. So, so we have for the last two two years, we've been privileged to hear these wonderful talks. And we're looking forward to Bob Spicer's uh, talk. I think it's it's going to come uh, very soon. Is, is that it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Next talk is with Bob. Okay, great. Great. Well, thank you. Okay, thank nice. you very much. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, I am pleased to say that, you know, we are moving forward with the, the film. Um, so that that was um, that's really good. very good. Uh, yeah. it, 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 you know, this is what we need. This is yep. exactly what. We well, need. you have you have been the inspiration for you know, carrying <laughs> this handle forward with your you know many you know outreach things in, in India. So you're the you know, you know the model. Um, anyway, it's this is the way forward. I think. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, bye, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So. We have Mike, Mike Sully with us. Um, um, uh, we, I don't think he's there. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, uh, I think, uh, yes. No, can I ask some more questions, uh, Nigel, on this? Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah, course. yeah. So, I think the right question to ask you is when uh, the in, uh, India actually was with the Africa, Antarctica, and when the things were uh, very close, when the Cambrian, during Cambrian times, and the trilobites, which you are finding in the Himalayas, and what is the relationship uh, between the Himalayan uh, trilobites, the Antarctica trilo- trilobites, African oh. trilobites, the Australian trilobites, and uh, the Himalayan trilobites, which you found in Spiti oh. and uh, in uh, Zanskar, mm. and also what we find in the Peninsular part of India. Ah, well. So yes. So I, now uh, I like to I like uh, you to comment on this. And the second thing is, what could be the timing of uh, drifting of uh, India from there? You know, maybe. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, I'll answer the first question. <clears throat> uh, so the second question first, because again, this is an area that I'm not specialist in. I understand that that rifting. Um, of India from Africa and Madagascar, you know, occurred about 180 million years ago in the Jurassic. Um, and then the, the uh, Kagulian, um, the, the other side um, at, at 120. Um, but I am not, you know, uh, have no you know, direct knowledge of that. Um, for the, for the, um, the, uh, the other question though about the Cambrian. Yeah, 
um, <clears throat> you know, for a long time, um, even before plate tectonics, um, it was known that uh, uh, Cambrian trilobites, when mapped around the world, formed two major provinces. Uh, one called the uh, Olinello province and the other called the Red Lichiad province. And the Red Lichiad province was named um, for a trilobite um, that was uh, first described from the Salt Range. Um, uh, Red Lichia Nertlingi, after, um, uh, named after Nertling, who worked for the Geological Survey of India. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so that is, you know, it is, it, it is that whole province turned out to be basically Gondwana. Um, it was not understood at that time to uh, to be Gondwana, but the Red Lichia Trilobite province includes the Gondwanan um, uh, continents and some other peripheral regions like parts of China. Um, and I, I should also say that that um, so that's one. You know, example of where the very early work that was done by the officers of the Geological Survey of India um, what, what was some of the first work that was done in the southern continents and, and uh, in the Gondwanan continents. Um, another very important thing, and this is something that uh, Birendra Singh and, and, and colleagues in, in Chandigarh and uh, others and, and, uh, have worked on, now are working on, um, is you know, that the, the, the formal base for the third series of the Cambrian system is now based on the first occurrence of Erectocephalus indicus, um, which was first described um, uh, from the Himalaya by Reed in, in 1910 um, from Hayden's collections. And so an Indian fossil um, has you know, the, the honor of, of being uh, the, the official designator of the base of the third series of the, of, the, of the Cambrian system just recently um, was chosen. Um, so these, you know, the, 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 this, um, this early history of the of work in um, the, the uh, Indian subcontinent is, um, you know, is, is an important part of that, uh, that tradition. And you're absolutely right that um, these, there are shared fossils um, that uh, uh, indicate connectedness of those uh, areas and even more interestingly you know show connections to um, other parts of the world like the various pieces of China um, and uh, Sibamasu for example you know what now makes up Thailand and and Myanmar um, and parts of uh, Baoshan in China so um, so the, the 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 fossil heritage is very important especially when combined with other geological knowledge like the zircons. Mm -hmm. uh, so now, now we are again, uh, <laughs> we can't ask you much questions on, uh, uh, as Robert Spicer has already asked you, what is your opinion on uh, the timing of the collision? But interestingly, you have uh, actually the museum, the concept of museum which we are trying to build is also museum of evolution. And uh, we have got a lot of uh, stromatolites, adiacara, trilobites, fossils, and um, uh, we have got some very interesting, uh, yeah, as you mentioned from Rioli, we got some dinosaurs. Mm. And uh, I was in that uh, team which was chaired by uh, Ashok Sani and IGCP, which actually led to the declaration of that dinosaur as a way back in 1996-97. But, but interestingly, now, the, since we are making it in Kasoli, and uh, the thrust was like, uh, since the fossils which we are getting from Kasoli are uh, uh, very interesting uh, species, about five of them, the Garcinia, Gluta, Combritum, Cyzesium, and I, I think Robert Spicer was also there when uh, when I was doing my PhD and he, he paid a, a visit to the, to the field at that time. So at that time we were doing this identification with the Birbal Sani Institute. And now after so long, we got uh, not exactly similar flora, but similar fauna in Kargil mm -hmm. and also in Neoma and Ladakh. So this becomes a very interesting uh, evidences for maybe maybe understanding the timing of the collision 
and the paleogeographic and the paleo latitudinal position of India at the time. Yeah. Yes. And, and yeah. I, I, so, I just, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, please. Well, I was just, you know, a, a few weeks ago, I, um, I heard a wonderful talk. Somebody would be very good for your series. Um, okay. is, is Dr. Xiaoming Wang um, mm -hmm. from Los Angeles County um, uh, Museum, uh, mm -hmm. talking about the rising of Tibet and um, the, the migration of, of mammals um, out of Tibet into mm -hmm. um, the, the, the northern continents in um, and sort of anticipation of the, uh, of, the, of the Ice Age and how you know, many of the progenitors um, of the, the Ice Age um, mammal fauna um, you know, had their origin in, uh, in related to, to Tibetan uplift. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that, that might So maybe, be maybe you can recommend his name and then uh, maybe we can yeah, have I it. Will, I will, yeah. uh, because we will, have, uh, we will have it in the month of <laughs> November. I think that is the time when mammals will come, you know. <laughs> yeah. so now, well, he's happy with, the, with, the, with, the, uh, with Peter Molnar. It, it just worked coincidentally. And then now you come with the Cambrian sequence and then we have series of other things planned till June with the, and then, yeah. And now, and again, I, I'll just uh, get back to the tectonics part of it. So how, how, how do you relate the paleogeographic position of uh, uh, the trilobites and the Cambrian fossils, which you mentioned in your talk, the paleogeographic and the paleo latitudinal positions, you know? At the mm. time of formation, you know, now they are they are almost not autochthonous, but they are all allochthonous units mm. deposits. Yeah. So maybe have any studies been done, or have you thought about this of the paleolithic yes. position? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. So yeah, so that's a very interesting um, question, and you know, just as today, um, different animals and plants have different sort of controls on their distribution um, in in the Cambrian amongst. Um, the trilobite faunas and the other, you know, brachiopods and small shellies and other things. Um, there are, you know, very interesting uh, patterns that um, uh, relate to particular morphologies. So, for example, there are some trilobites which seem to be able to cross ocean basins quite easily, um, but on the other hand, were restricted to warmer waters or equatorial waters. So. You know, we, we find some trilobites in the Himalaya, which we find, um, you know, quite widely around the world, but only in continents that um, were, uh, were equatorial. So presumably these things had long larval stages. They were able to migrate across oceans, but they were not tolerant of colder water. Um, on the other hand, there are some species which occur right the way around the Gondwan margin. And when I showed you the picture of the Cambrian world, um, yeah. Gondwana land is kind of smeared out because um, of course Gondwana was at equatorial levels in India uh, and Australia, um, but uh, at, at high Southern latitudes. Um, and so of course, just as today, there are different faunas living at different latitudes. Um, uh, so too in the Cambrian. But there are also some, um, tr some trilobite species that were quite good at tolerating a wide range of, of temperature conditions. Um, maybe they were not good at getting across open ocean basins, but they were able to follow the margin of Gondwana land around. And so this is really wonderful because these different attributes allow us to correlate when yes. we find different yes. trilobites together, so we, can, we, can, we can tie, you know, through yeah. an intermediate place, two things that we didn't know before. So that's a very, you know, a, a power of the of the skeletonized fossil record. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's very interesting. So now, last time also I asked the same question. Now, now if we if they are now uh, the equatorial conditions, you know, you said that most of them, majority of them are the equatorial, and then maybe the at that time. Yes, it, it suits, you know, because of the uh, recent research has been done uh, on uh, uh, the paleomagnetic studies and the patterns by MIT and, uh, and some Nenital and some uh, researchers from Nenital. So they have come up with very interesting results and then the Khardumla volcanics and all, they are shifting it back to the equator and uh, 
then my findings of these uh, species which i mentioned they are not uh, any not any way related or we don't find any evidences in um, in himalayas but they are more confined to the andaman nicobar islands malaysia mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, indonesia mm -hmm. so the kosoli also going back to equator the khardungla also going back to equator and the zanskar and the spiti fossils also going back to equator mm -hmm. so so that that brings us to very interesting uh, conclusions you know maybe about the timing of uh, yes as you rightly said wonderful talk but but these precambrian fossils also tell us that at one point of time maybe they were on on the gondwana margins you know maybe, maybe what is your uh, talk uh, say on this you know what do you well i i certainly yeah i i do um, think that there's you know good evidence from the stratigraphy that that uh, you know uh, the himalaya was you know part of the north indian margin um, that uh, you know yeah. uh, the i i think you know that's a conclusion that i think our work warrants um, and so and and yes the you know the comparisons um, were of the fauna the closest uh, 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 associations are with um, australia uh, but even closer associations actually with north and south china the the two major blocks of China. China is made of nine different pieces, at least nine different pieces, but the main blocks of China are so, north. So uh, China, and now again, I'll just say which part of China, the Tibetan part of China, or you are talking about the original China? So oh, well, I told you occupied, about- Tibetan yeah. occupied China? Um, or, uh, so I, maybe I, I, we, can, I, we can just try to yeah, understand because yeah, China becomes, you yeah, know, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, 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 yeah, I'm not talking about uh, the, the different parts of Tibet, although they have a very interesting history. Um, okay. The Lhasa block and the Chantang and, and, and uh, Kunlun, et cetera. I'm talking really about, you know, what is the major blocks of what are called North China and South China. So these okay. are today's uh, geographic blocks of of the, the, the southern provinces and the northern provinces. And they were certainly separate in the Cambrian. Um, and um, there was a paper published in Geology last year, which um, I reviewed, but disagreed with, um, that placed North China, for example, um, as an island continent between North America, Laurentia, as it was called, um, the North American continent, and Gondwana at that time. I, I don't agree with that, but I do think that there were connections um, in, in, uh, in the fauna. And so, you know, this is this wonderful sort of jigsaw puzzle of, of, with moving pieces that change their shapes um, uh, uh, through time um, of, of trying to establish these relationships. And I, you know, as Bob has shown, uh, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing about fossils is that they have a, a little bit of independence from other sorts of geological data. You know, so much of geological data is, is sort of bound up with how you interpret, say, a, a tectonic system, say, a, uh, <clears throat> um, a collisional belt or you know, an origin. We, you know, we interpret the geological data in terms of that, the understanding of how those processes work. Um, you know, fossils are a little bit independent of that. And so we can look at their, their distributions in a way to test um, uh, reconstructions that are based on kind of integrations of other sorts of geological data. So I think that paleontology has a, you know, a wonderful, um, unique perspective on this. Um, and I think it's also a tremendous opportunity for Deshi scientists because um, you know, it takes a long time to find fossils and to yes, I, 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 good I specimens and, and, um, and, you know, to travel up to some of these remote places. And, and most of us who are privileged to visit, uh, you know, uh, can't spend that long a period and, 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 you know, only see a relatively small, uh, you know, amount of material. So this is, these are really, you know, although paleontology is a, you know, considered in some ways a very traditional field, it is, um, it's a very powerful field for contributing to other areas of geology. And, and this is where, you know, I think that local geologists can really make a, a strong contribution. Yeah, very true. I, I, and I remember when I was a, a university uh, geology student in first year, I was fascinated by Medlicott. I belong mm. to Kosoli, so he had collected the first fossils from Kosoli, and then 
it took me around one year, you know, to get hold of fossils, one fossil maybe. And, but then after that, I was just able to associate where I will get the fossil, where I will not get the fossil. And then I had the largest collection of fossils, which I'm trying to keep in some museum, but nobody was ready to take it and, the, and wanted to display it the way I wanted. So the idea of this Tethys Fossil Museum came up and then, uh, and we are almost all working in the same sequence as we, you are. So yep. we start. We also start with the, but we started start uh, slightly earlier with the uh, 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 how the universe originates and how things other things. We have ten sections, natural sections, and then we have man and environment section of, of in our museum. So it's coming up in a in a very systematic way, and Oshin is um, having a tough time figuring out how to just uh, <laughs> draw all these uh, things, you know, in a in a in a very very interesting way. So that we well, are keeping your... this. We are keeping this at a museum so that anybody who's about uh, uh, studying in fourth or fifth class with a 20, 25 minutes of uh, you know walk through the museum, he, he understands what is evolution, how everything evolved, how how the Himalayas were formed, how how the how we use fossils to do various things, the Alfred Wagner's. We have Suez, we have Medlicott, we have Charles Darwin. We have we are dedicating it to Charles Darwin and. Uh, Mental. So everything, you know, the science, the local, and how how they can just figure out everything, you know. And I like the concept of the comics, you know, uh, in a very simple way with the local dialect, you know. How how we can the just. Robert Spicer uh, has something to say too. Okay. okay, okay. Could I just ask, Oshin, were those your reconstructions that were shown at the beginning? Because uh, 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 Ritesh showed some some reconstructions of the Cambrian seafloor, or. Right. Those, did you draw those? Uh, they haven't been drawn by me yet, but they will be drawn. They will be. In, will be okay, great. In, in time. Great. So you will be seeing a lot so, of art. So we are also I looking for uh, looking you know, that someone. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, you can just uh, take up. Well, yeah, yeah. Right. please take take it on. Yeah. I, I just wanted to, to support what Nigel was just saying about the value of fossils. Um, provided that the fossils are accurately dated, they can be used to keep all the other geologists honest. Um, <laughs> there's, there's an awful lot of interpretation that is built a, a, upon things like tectonic models and what we expect to see. And uh, a classic example of, of this, which I will touch on in my talk, is the interpretation of uh, isotopes in terms of surface height. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you get a, a big, uh, or there is a, a big discrepancy between the surface heights indicated by the isotopes based on certain assumptions and what the fossils actually tell you about what the surface height was. And the only way you can discredit the fossils is if you want to rewrite the rules of evolution. So um, I think it's, a, a, you know, the fossils in particular, fossils in museums are incredibly valuable provided they have accurate information on where they came from and what, uh, what the age call is on them. Uh, but yeah, uh, I will be returning to this story in, in my talk, but um, I just wanted to back you up there. I think fossils are honest data. Yes, yes. fossils don't lie. And that, exactly. that, that is what Alfred Wegener understood, you know, and whatever anybody said, this is fossil. And that is the plate tectonics theory and the continental drift theory. And now I think... Uh, uh, Nigel, I think I'm so impressed that now we have almost got maybe with this talk, you know, some evidences that maybe the Himalayan fossils of uh, uh, the Cambrian trilobites and all, they were more equatorial and maybe uh, we can find more evidences that they were part of the Gondwana land. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think now uh, with your beautiful uh, outreach education program, which I think we will be also uh, be shortly coming up uh, very soon if we get some more funding from some AP. What was that? Association of Petroleum, Petroleum Geologists? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
<laughs> so we are also looking for some Indian <laughs> partners <laughs> who can yes. just fund this research. But whatever resources we have, we are doing. Uh, uh, I think by uh, very soon we should whatever resources we have, we uh, we will be able to make up this entire story, and then we, with the with your uh, um, series coming up, we can put this in in the museum also. Be great. You can yeah, allow us. Yes, of course. It will be yeah. freely available over the internet, but okay. we would be very happy to have it. I mean, the whole point, of course, is to make it uh, freely available on YouTube um, so that, uh, you know, um, that children who, you know, if there's one cell phone in the village, um, then then children can access this freely. Mm. Yeah, mm. That's, that's the absolute. But yeah. <clears throat> every reason to have uh, associations with particular institutions. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful, Nigel. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Ritesh. Thank you, thank Robert. You. Um, I, I just wanted to ask in the uh, part amongst the participants if anyone has any questions. Um, they can put them up in the chat window. If uh, not, we can head towards uh, summating this session. Uh, James Peter, would you like to ask something? I, I'm, I'm just fine. fine okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. All right. I think um, okay. we've reached to the end of the session. So thank you, Nigel, for such an invigorating session and uh, for this deliberation on exchange of thoughts, ideas, and your studies. Thank you all for attending this lecture. We thank uh, Dr. Hariraj Dandi for sponsoring the series of webinars on Himalayas for 2022. We greatly appreciate his generosity and his support, uh, and in turn, giving us the strength to support the cause of promoting and preserving the fossil wealth of the Himalayas. Prof uh, as we all know, Professor Emeritus from School of Environment, Earth and Ecosystem Sciences, Open University, uh, he is, is also present uh, here with us today. So stay tuned for his upcoming lecture on the 22nd of March on the Cenozoic evolution of the Himalayas, Tibetan landscape, stories from plant fossils and isotopes. So for further, uh, for further updates on uh, lectures, webinars, follow, follow us on our Instagram page, Tethi's Fossil Museum. And kindly share your email IDs in the chat box for updates and notifications on uh, further sessions like these. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Nigel. We, we, are, we are really grateful to you. It was very really wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Oh. Oh. <laughs> very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Good night. <laughs> so, so it was good, huh? Uh, we request uh, everyone to send in their email IDs in the chat window if they can, if uh, so we can update you on our further sessions. Thank you. Okay, Arya. Good night. Good night, okay. Good night. Good night. Good night, yeah. Okay. I think we should end it, huh? Yes, let's end it. Okay, we are leaving now. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs>